Alzheimer's is fundamentally, as we discovered, a network insufficiency. In other words, what I mean by that is you have a whole set of things, as you alluded to, in your brain that are critical for making and keeping synapses, making and keeping connections. Okay, and now when you have too little supply or too much demand, your brain literally has to downsize. So you have two modes. We just, we looked at the molecules that are actually involved with this. And there is this master switch, which is the parent of the amyloid that everybody vilifies in this disease. We always think of Alzheimer's as, oh, this is a disease where your brain degenerates, true and it's due to this amyloid. Well, actually the amyloid is part of a response to various insults. You're listening to the Nutrition World Podcast, a show about navigating the intricacies of holistic wellness. We're a natural health food store located in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and we believe that optimal health and peak performance should be accessible to everyone. Hello, everyone. Here I am, Ed Jones, again with Nutrition World and Nutrition World's podcast. You know, one of the legacies I want to leave in my life, uh, here I am almost 66 years old, been in this business of wellness for almost 44 years, so well over four decades. Uh, and early on, it was, you know, different probably uh, paradigm. But now, uh, the last two decades, it's about empowering people because we have a system that's very broken in some ways, and there's a lot of great people in that system who care, but the system itself seems to be broken, which inhibits a lot of us to have healing, have advice, have education that actually works, number one, and two, is safe, and that's not being talked about in any uh, hardly a uh, mainstream medicine. You know, I follow all of the people in the area of wellness. Uh, we have 17 practitioners at my wellness center, and it it's astounds me how much information is actually out there that is not being filtered down to the practicing healthcare worker, practicing physician, practicing nurse practitioner. Uh, and there's a lot behind that. But the gentleman today that we have has been one uh, person I've followed for many, many years. And it is so important today, we're going to be talking about Alzheimer's. We all are, are known people who have it. And like uh, Dr. Bredesen, who I'm going to re announce here in a second, in his book, he says, we all know people who have been cured of cancer, but how many people do we know that have, has, we wouldn't even say the cure word, managed Alzheimer's very well? Almost yeah. no one. So, you know, uh, many years, some years ago, there was a book written, The End of Alzheimer's by Dr. Dale Bredesen. And Dr. Bredesen's internationally recognized expert in the mechanisms of neurodegenerative diseases, such as Alzheimer's. He had a faculty position, University of California. San Francisco, UCLA, and University of California, San Diego, uh, and directed the program on aging at the Burnham Institute before coming to the Buck Institute in 1988. He is not only super credible, mm -hmm. extremely uh, intelligent, but he's a brave hero in my mind. And it takes brave heroes to step out of the mainstream and speak truth. And welcome to Nutrition World, Dr. Bredesen. Thanks so much for having me, Ed. I really appreciate it. And, you know, I've, I've read your book, read it early on, and uh, what, my main hobby in life is studying uh, integrative, uh, holistic methods to help empower people and myself as the yeah. aging process occurs. And we all know pretty much what Alzheimer means to uh, anyone in this world. And I think most people have a great, great fear of Alzheimer's, probably more than they even do cancer and heart disease. And because, one, we're not looking at anything that seems to be making a difference other than babysitting them as they get uh, further down the spiraling hole of, of, of despair, basically. And the one thing that I want to say early on, I know you'll say it, is there's like if we have a house that has 36 holes in the roof and we fix two yeah. of those, we're really not going to do anything to prevent the damage from within in that house. Well, that's what you right. say is really there's like 36 different components to why we have neurodegenerative diseases. So welcome again to Nutrition World's podcast, Dr. Bredesen. Let's start talking and empowering people. How can they help them and their family members with this information that you have? Yeah, it's a great point, Ed. So let's start by saying, let's start by putting this in perspective. So the, the COVID-19 pandemic has killed over 1 million Americans now. Alzheimer's of the currently living Americans, 
will kill about 45 million of the currently living Americans. So it wow. actually dwarfs the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, there's some information that it's now become the third leading cause of death, but it's in the, it's in the top five or so. Uh, and depends on which study you look at, whether there were autopsies, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So it is a, a remarkably common, unfortunately. And the main thing that we found, and we spent 30 years in the lab and published over 220 uh, peer-reviewed papers, the main thing that we found was that when you look at this disease, it is not a simple disease. What, for example, like pneumococcal pneumonia. You get the pneumococcus, you treat the pneumococcus, things are good, even though you might have other problems going on. We as physicians have gotten away with treating just that one thing. Alzheimer's is fundamentally, as we discovered, a network insufficiency. In other words, what I mean by that is you have a whole set of things, as you alluded to, in your brain that are critical for making and keeping synapses, making and keeping connections, okay? And now, when you have too little supply or too much demand, your brain literally has to downsize. So you have two modes. We, just, we looked at the molecules that are actually involved with this, and there is this master switch, which is the parent of the amyloid that everybody vilifies in this disease. We always think of Alzheimer's as, oh, this is a disease where your brain degenerates, true, and it's due to this amyloid. Well, actually, the amyloid is part of a response to various insults. And there are four big areas. And you mentioned, like, so what can we do? How do we empower people? So first of all, to know this is more than just about amyloid. So there are four big areas. Number one, it's anything that causes ongoing inflammation. And that can be a poor oral microbiome. That can be a leaky gut. That can be chronic sinusitis. That can be herpes simplex any of these things that cause long-term inflammation can be just a horrible diet. These things will tell your brain, you got to work a little harder. You got to work extra. And so now, as we get a little older, that can actually make it so that you cannot keep up with that demand. The second thing is exposure to toxins. And those are three different types of things. Inorganics, things like mercury or air pollution. Organics, things like glyphosate, toluene, benzene, and then biotoxins. That's the big surprise related to things like mold. And if you've got the various types of mold that cause the biotoxins that can be damaging to your brain, and that's really five major mold species, stachybotrys, which is that toxic black mold, aspergillus, penicillium, ketomium, and wallemia. So you should, everyone should know, check it out. This is why we recommend everybody who's 45 years of age or older, please get a cognoscopy. We all know to get a colonoscopy when you turn 50. Don't forget your brain. Get a cognoscopy if you're 45 years of age or older. It's pretty easy to do. And we can then tell you, are, are you at high risk for things? And make sure, let's make sure that everyone stays sharp to 100. So those are the first two things, inflammation and toxins. Then low energetics. That's the other part. So energetics, you've got to supply your brain. That's your blood flow to the brain. That's your oxygenation, which is why so many people with sleep apnea have cognitive decline. That's your mitochondrial function, which is why you support your mitochondria, of course. And that's your ketone, because your brain has to burn either glucose or ketones. And so you want to be able to go back and forth. For many of us, we're able to go back and forth between glucose and ketones. The brain's happy. As we get a little older, we lose both of those. We lose the glucose because we have insulin resistance because of poor nutrition. And on the other hand, because we have this chronically high insulin levels because of the high-carb diets, we're not able to produce and utilize the ketones. So we have the worst of both worlds. So when we see patients with cognitive decline, this is an energetic emergency. And then the last of the four is trophic influences. And that means growth factors like nerve growth factor and BDNF. BDNF goes up with exercise. So good thing for exercise. It also goes up with being in ketosis. Um, also goes up with things like whole coffee fruit extract. All those things can boost your BDNF and, and as I mentioned, NGF. And then now the second part is hormones. So 
estradiol, testosterone, progesterone, pregnenolone, thyroid, DHEA, all important for brain function. And then the third of those is nutrients, things like vitamin D, vitamin B12, omega-3s. These are all critical. Choline is another big one because it is a precursor for the acetylcholine that is the most important neurotransmitter for memory, and which is low, by the way, in patients with Alzheimer's. So now, instead of looking at this disease and, and the risk for this, as simply, you know, something simple that, oh, let's get rid of a misfolded protein, then you start to see that it actually makes some sense. This is a beautiful, beautiful network in your brain that you are impacting. And your brain can now go into either a mode of building and maintaining when things are good, or it can go into a protective downsizing mode, which is what ultimately becomes Alzheimer's. Much as we saw with COVID-19, we were told in early 2020, that we should shelter in place, that we should uh, socially distance, we shouldn't be going into work. And what happened? We entered a recession. That's exactly what's happening with your brain. Your brain has these insults. It says, I'm moving now into a protective downsizing mode. And guess what? The amyloid that is vilified in this disease actually is an antimicrobial agent as professors Robert Moyer and Rudy Tanzi from Harvard showed a number of years ago. So it's important for us to understand what's actually going on. Then we can check out and see for each person, because each person is different, what are your insults? What are the things that are creating risk for you? And then of course, that includes your genetics. And then we can address those things. And we have tremendous results with a published trial in which 84% of people actually improved their scores. Didn't just slow their decline, actually improved their scores. That is mind boggling, number one, because one is, He's certainly speaking my language, too, is it, it gives people such hope. And the hope has to come from those who understand this 36 holes in the roof philosophy, right. uh, because traditional medicine is a reductionist type of medicine where they are trying to find a single molecule to fix a single issue. That will never happen with this complex disease. And I use in my analogies when I talk to clients every single day, an orchestra analogy that if you had an orchestra with 500 instruments and musicians and it was out of tune, you'll never go pick George out of the group and go fix right. the music. It'll be dozens of people that you need to tune and perhaps instruments. The same, obviously, with the analogy uh, of you and the 36 holes in the roof. And you mentioned mold. Mold is so epidemic, and yeah. you'll never find a traditional practitioner who will, one, recognize it or know a lot about it, most likely, and it uh, plus all the other things that you're talking about. Uh, I just am, am so inspired by the fact that you have a system, I'll say, or a protocol that an integrated right. physician or even a person who is very skilled or wellness skilled could actually take the recommendations from your blood work, which we, like yep. you say, you have to see and personalize why is this person going down this spiraling path well, the only right. way to do that is to have a checks uh, somewhat, and the blood testing obviously is the most accurate way to do that, and then right. set up a plan. And that plan is um, is using a lot of nutrients and also lifestyle and, and, and. But that's how it works. I mean, yes, it would be cool to have that single pill. That's never going to happen, is it, Dr. Bredesen? Well, I, yeah, you know, it, it could, it, it might, but it doesn't actually fit the biology. What I actually think will happen is that these kind of silly ideas now, which are really kind of now outdated, we're going to give you a single drug, as you said, you know, one molecule is going to cure this entire network of things, which is, this is actually naive. Instead, let's take a precision medicine approach, just as is being done very successfully with some cancers. Let's look at all the different pieces. Let's address those. And then let's add a drug on top of the protocol that targets specific things. So for example, um, a mediator, tau, is one of, the, one of the mediators of the pullback. So is amyloid. Fine, amyloid is there but you can't get rid of the thing that's actually protecting you and just expect that that alone is gonna be enough. Let's get rid of all the things that are actually causing the problem. Then we can begin slowly to get rid of the response to the problem, makes a lot more sense. And the other thing I should mention, 
Uh, when you, you, you mentioned the 36 holes in the roof, well, when you look at for each person, what you see is that different people have different subtypes of Alzheimer's. We see people where it's more of an inflammatory process. That's the main bad actor that is causing this response. Others, it's more of an atrophic process. You don't have enough support. Others, it's more of a toxic process. You've got exposure to those mycotoxins that, as you said, physicians aren't even looking for them. And unfortunately, they are very common causes of disease. And others, of course, you have uh, infections that are typically not known about. And you know, there's some really interesting work where people took uh, cells, brain cells basically, and looked at, okay, if we infect these with herpes simplex, because we know that herpes simplex is associated with increased risk for Alzheimer's. And in one remarkable study from Taiwan, just treating outbreaks of herpes simplex on the lip in people who were in middle age, they reduced their risk for dementia quite a bit, more than half striking reduction. So they said, you know, how is it that herpes, which we know infects brain tissue, but when you look at with someone with Alzheimer's, you know, you don't see a rampaging herpes simplex infection. So how does this work? What they found was really interesting. They had to go to very, very small infection, literally one virus per 10,000 cells to get this Alzheimer type response. So it looks like what's happening here is you're getting these minimal, minimal, it's not like a rampaging infection here. You're getting these minimal exposures and it is to the toxins and various infections. Bacteria from the mouth have been found in the brain. So P. gingivalis, which is one of the ones that's associated with poor dentition, has been found in the brain of many patients with Alzheimer's. So it's this response where you're saying, okay, we are under threat even though the infection itself is currently minimal, we're going to put out this response that actually walls this off. The amyloid sequesters these microbes and kills them. So you are going to have to work with a slightly smaller brain. Well, instead, let's go the other direction. Let's get rid of these things instead of trying to get rid of what they're walled off with. And we'll, we, that approach has actually led to much better outcomes, as I mentioned. And uh, our studies are freely available online. So you can look up a Journal of Alzheimer's Disease. It was published just this past June, the results of our clinical trial. And we're now starting a larger randomized controlled trial this year. How exciting. Got to cover the uh, Aricept drug. What's your opinion yes. on that? Such a good point. So as you know, there are three different types of drugs now for Alzheimer's. Aricept and, and similar ones increase your cholinergic tone. So yes, they, they're basically saying, we're going to prevent your brain from breaking down this acetylcholine. We tend, as I say, to go on the nutritional side and let's give you more to begin with, instead of poisoning your enzyme that breaks it down. The problem with it is, and it does give you a short-term burst, but the problem with it is, number one, when people who took that drug were followed over years, they actually did worse than people who were not followed, unfortunately. Second thing is, if you cold turkey that, if you take it and then you suddenly stop, you get much worse because your brain responds to your inhibiting one of its natural enzymes by making more of that enzyme. So now you suddenly stop it, you've got more of this, and now you really go downhill with the acetylcholine. So that's, a, that's the issue. Can be okay for short term, not a good idea for long term, please don't cold turkey it. Second group, memantine, which is basically trying to prevent this activation, uh, so-called excitotoxicity. It has such a tiny impact that the people who are on it, their families couldn't tell who was on the placebo and who was on the drug. So it's a tiny, tiny effect, really has not helped. And also, by the way, shown over the long haul, people who took it didn't do as well. Now, the one that's gotten all the press recently, as you know, these are the anti-amyloid antibodies. The idea there is, let's get rid of that amyloid, and then you won't have Alzheimer's disease. Well, it's turned out that's just incorrect. And so many of these failed. Bapinuzumab was the first. It failed. It didn't make people any better. Solanezumab, gantanerumab, crinazumab, these are all antibodies that have failed. Atacanumab came out, and in one study it failed, and in one study it had a tiny effect. Now, when I say an effect, it doesn't make people better. It doesn't keep them the same. 
What it does is it slowed the decline in early stage people only by 22%. Now, you know, they hailed this as a breakthrough. If Elon Musk told you that everybody in SpaceX died because the, the, the missiles exploded uh, and now the big breakthrough was they died 22% later, you wouldn't be very impressed. I mean, that, that's the problem here. It really doesn't make you any better. So now the, the, la the latest one is called Lacanamab, and that's just been approved on accelerated approval by the FDA. And again, does it make you better? It's, it's slowed by 27%. Now, for comparison, what did better than Lacanamab? Extra virgin olive oil alone has also been published. It had better outcomes than Lacanamab in terms of the studies. So this is a minimal, minimal effect, but of course, the drug company is paying many people to say this is great stuff. All the experts have been paid. They say, oh, this is wonderful. The Alzheimer's Association says we think this is an important drug. Uh, the bottom line is it's a drug that was developed because they didn't understand how the disease actually works. And so the idea was let's just get rid of the amyloid. I actually think the time to do that is after you've gotten rid of all the things that are causing it, and then do it very slowly. But they're doing it the opposite. They're doing it just as a monotherapy, and they're doing it with m massive amounts to get rid of all the amyloid. And so you can imagine a lot of these people actually get worse. And here's an example. One of the things that amyloid does in protecting you, not only does it wall off these various organisms, but it also patches, rents, in blood vessels. So it is like putting a patch on a tire. Now you're giving a drug that rips that patch off. So what do you think is going to happen? People bleed into their brains. And in fact, there are brain, there is brain bleeding is one of the side effects of this drug. Three people so far have died in association with taking this drug. So uh, I think we have a ways to go before we can say, you know, here's a drug that's really fantastic for Alzheimer's. And so lecanemab is not that drug. Uh, there's a group of physicians that have urged the FDA before giving full approval, because they've just given accelerated approval mm -hmm. now so far, they've urged them to reconvene an outside uh, objective expert panel to look at, does this really help? Is it really worth the risk, et cetera? And of course, the push has been the opposite. Um, let's, you know, let's go ahead and uh, let's approve this immediately and let's pay massive. And I should mention, this will increase the cost of Medicare for everyone. Um, this will cost somewhere, by the time you include the infusions, because you have to go in to get this injected, mm -hmm. by the time you, uh, you have to have scans, because you've got to see if you're bleeding into your brain, um, you're looking at somewhere between twenty-five dollars and $50,000 per year for the rest wow. of your life. So uh, there, there's a lot of suboptimal uh, approach here, and I think we can do much better. And as we showed in our trial, we can do much better where we can actually improve people for much, much less expense. Amazing. And what common sense. And I always like to go back to a term I started using 20 years ago, ancient wisdom. You know, as smart as we get, as smart as we think we are, we still can't fool basically Mother Nature or God or the yes. universe. Whatever designed this intricate, massive, beautiful orchestra within us, you stop one thing and you think it's good, well, you end up doing like uh, like the COX-2 inhibitor, we take a drug, uh, you know, painkiller. Well, it, it, it slows it slows your pain down, but then it causes heart attacks. It is such a magical little balance that goes on within our system. Yeah. And the traditional mm -hmm. people don't really recognize it. Secondly, is we have an underlying agenda of profit to a level that has never been seen in the history of mankind that actually doesn't put the person first. It puts the profit first. And that is mm -hmm. not a very healthy system for this country, for sure, or for us individuals at all, is it? It's such a good point because, you know, what I've found, you know, I, I trained way back in the 1970s and 1980s in classical medicine. You, mm -hmm. you decide what it is. That's the goal in, in, in medicine. You know, is this measles? Is it a broken leg? What is it? And then you either send the person to surgery or you write a prescription. 
Now, 21st century medicine is not about what, it's about why, why it is. Why did you get Alzheimer's or why are you starting to have cognitive problems? And I should mention the approach we've taken also takes normal cognition and improves it because most of us have some suboptimal nature of our cognition because we've got some exposure to these various things. And so the idea there is to look at what's actually causing. Now, what we found is exactly what you said. People have made decisions. Am I going with the truth? Am I going with the data, what actually is for the person? Or am I going with, with what maximizes profits for the company? Uh, or, what, or am I going to go with the, uh, the politics? There is a lot of push from a lot of these various uh, medical politicians uh, to say, okay, we're going to go with this. Even though the drug doesn't work very well, we're going to push you to use this drug. And I think this is really unfortunate because I think people are not being served. They're not getting the best outcomes because, as you say, there are a huge amounts at stake. This, this could, you know, any drug that actually works well for Alzheimer's will be a $500 billion drug. So the company has actually spent around $28 billion so far pushing this drug. And so no surprise, mm -hmm. they are paying people various things here. As, as one person pointed out, Virtually every op-ed that has been written in support of this drug was written by someone who was on the take from the drug company. So mm. this is this is unfortunate. Well, we have to take control of our own health to empower ourselves, and we have to find what I used uh, a lot of times, the analogy, we have to find a team to help us age gracefully, and that team has to be a yeah. trusted team of people who kind of have their eyes open, who are a little bit braver. Yeah. Certainly, you're the king of bravery, and I say often, too, I think as we age, we have to decide, are we going to go into the regular pharmacy or the green pharmacy, not meaning that all things in the natural world are totally healthy and good and great. We all have our, our issues, but... The thing is, your protocol for Alzheimer's, I can only imagine how it would also escalate the health, cardiovascular health, the physical health, the mental health. Forget that it even helped the Alzheimer's to help slow it down, prevent it from happening, sending people back in a better place. That alone could add years to their health, add years to their quality of life. So in your book, I know you have uh, the protocol. How does a person yes. start to do this? And I know that you know that we partnered, you partnered some up with Life Seasons, which is an amazing quality company, uh, but they need, they need help in order to make all this happen. What's their first step? Absolutely. This is a really good point. And we have, by the way, there is training. We call this protocol RECODE for reversal of cognitive decline. We've now trained over 2,000 physicians uh, and as well as neuropsychologists, nurse practitioners, health coaches, brain health coaches, you know, on and on. Uh, so to look at and to understand how to do this, because as you said, you, you really have to look at what's causing the problem. And so you can think about this essentially in three steps. Step one is the basics. Just what you were saying, you want to get, make sure that you optimize things. And the basics are diet, exercise, sleep, stress, brain training, some detox, and some targeted supplements. And yeah, supplements, you know, as a physician who never used supplements when I was first trained, of course, they can be helpful. But again, people will try to tell you it's a cure for this or that. Typically, they aren't. They are helping your chemistry to get on the right track. You are optimizing your synaptic chemistry. And it's amazing how much you can do with optimal nutrition, exercise, sleep, stress. And so let's just start for a second with the, with the nutrition piece of it. I am not a nutritionist, but we're looking at the biochemistry of what is allowing you to make and keep memories, your neuroplasticity. And what works best for your brain is a plant-rich, mildly ketogenic diet. We do want it to be you, and we want you to be not only able to get into ketosis, but to be metabolically flexible. So you can utilize glucose, but you can also utilize ketones. You must be insulin sensitive. Insulin resistance is one of the most common risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. And there are about 80 million Americans who are insulin resistant because of these high carb diets and high stress lifestyles that so many of us are exposed to. So that's the critical piece. And of course, You've got to have a, it's got to include high fiber. So again, plant rich, 
The fiber is good for your detox. It's good for your glycemic load. It's good for your lipid profile. It's amazing how helpful this actually is. So optimal nutrition. And then, of course, you could include specific herbs in there that can actually be so helpful to your cognition. There is a tremendous amount you can do. Arguably, the nutrition piece is the most important piece. And it's surprising how beneficial it is for cognition. But of course, you want to add the exercise, the sleep. Sleep, we could spend hours talking about sleep, all the different issues. It's great to know how much sleep you've gotten, what's your oxygenation while you're sleeping. Most people aren't checking, most doctors aren't checking. The good news, you can do a lot yourself, just as you mentioned. You can do it with an Apple Watch, you can do it with an Aura Ring, you can do it with a Fitbit, you can do it with a simple oximeter. So you can look to see how your oxygenation is. There was a beautiful study that showed just looking at the average oxygenation while someone's sleeping, the so-called SpO2 mean, correlated beautifully with the size of various nuclei in your brain. So literally, as your oxygenation is going down at night, your brain is shrinking. We want to get that up. It's again, it's part of the energetic support. So that's the first piece. Those seven things, we call that the basic seven. Then you want to look beyond that. The second tier is to look at, do you have infections? Do you have toxins? Can we heal that gut? Let's get looking at the things that are actually getting into your brains, the organisms and things, and let's go after those. If you have recurrent herpes, easy to treat. You can treat it with things like valet cyclovir. You can even treat outbreaks with things like uh, lysine and things like that. So it's relatively easy to do. So that's the second tier. Look at the specifics. And then the third tier is the final piece is just troubleshooting. Okay, how are you doing? Has there been anything that's been missed? Sometimes for some people, if they haven't improved by the first six months, because it takes a few months, you have to remember when you get a diagnosis of Alzheimer's, um, it's been going on for 20 years. And I should mention one of the biggest problems in this field is that we only recognize it as a disease in its end stages. This is, this is as if you say to people, you know, don't come in until that lump on you has gone all over your body. Well, wait a minute. I mean, we want to get as early as possible. So when people develop Alzheimer's, we used to think of this as a disease of your 60s, 70s, 80s. No, it starts 20 years early. This is really a disease of your 30s, 40s, 50s that takes a little while to have severe symptoms. So phase one, you have no symptoms, but you can already find abnormalities, even in some people in their 20s and 30s on PET scans or spinal fluid. Okay, so most of us aren't going to go and get that as a as a screen, that's okay. But the next stage, so the second phase, um, is one that is called SCI, subjective cognitive impairment. A hundred percent of these people can be turned around and we see it all the time. So if you're having problems remembering numbers or you're having problems remembering names and things just aren't the way they used to be, it, unfortunately, the medical community has said, oh, don't worry about it. It's probably not Alzheimer's. And if it is, we don't have anything anyway. That's, not, that's the opposite of what you want to do. Get in, find out why you're not as sharp as you were. There are typically going to be reasons. And again, the cognoscopy will tell you, and you can address these things. Sometimes you're going to have some mild insulin resistance. Sometimes you're going to have some systemic inflammation. These are things that are easily picked up and, and addressed. Now that lasts, SCI lasts on average 10 years. So we have a huge window where we can really bring people back to normal. The third stage out of four is one that is called MCI, mild cognitive impairment. And I should say that's where the the ones were that were treated with the anti-amyloid antibodies. This is like, it's unfortunate that people call it mild cognitive impairment. It's like telling someone, don't worry, you only have mildly metastatic cancer. It's a late stage of the process. This should really be called relatively late stage Alzheimer's disease, but it's called MCI. Now, in our trial, 84% of those people got better. We didn't, in a trial, we didn't even take the ones that are SCI. Those are the easy, easy ones to fix. We took the MCIs and then early into dementia, which is very similar to to these amyloid trials. That each year, about 10% of those people will convert from MCI to dementia. And by definition, what these mean is 
SCI means you know that something's wrong, but you're still capable of scoring in the normal range on cognitive testing, which is why your doctor will say, oh, come back later. We had one guy recently who actually was all the way into the fourth stage, and his doctor told him, yeah, this is just normal aging. Oh my gosh, no, this guy actually had fairly significant dementia. So that's SCI. MCI is where you now are starting to have problems with your cognitive testing as well, but you're still able to do your activities of daily living. The fourth and final stage, dementia, means by definition, you've started to have trouble with your activities of daily living, taking care of yourself, paying your bills, doing your normal things, driving, things like that. So that is the dementia stage. And some of those people actually can turn around as well, but it gets harder and harder and harder as you go later and later and later, which is why we urge everyone, please get in as early as possible because there's so much that can be done. That is a that is such great hope. And also, I know some people are going to hear that and say it sounds overwhelming. Well, uh, you know, I try to put together a system that can empower people everywhere across the United States. You do have to search for these people who are credible like you, educated, open-minded, and are seekers of the truth, because it's not going to be found in traditional medicine. Secondly, I would guess that you'll agree to this, insurance won't really pay for these practitioners, because no system in this country is going to recognize the philosophy that you and I both believe in, uh, which is more integrative, which is fixing 30, or looking at 36 holes and fixing at least 15 that are not working, because it is a reductionist uh, system. I love the fact you talked about the uh, 90, the auction level, because my aura ring has been one of the things I talk about the most yep. in regard to sleep. It's been so informative to me because it actually helped me put together better plans to help me achieve better rim, better deep, and better oxygen based on the fact right. that I could say, what did I do last night that made me so good? What did I do that made me so poor? And I did a, an ebook years ago. It's one of our most popular on nutritionw.com. If they go, someone goes there, just type in ebook sleep, and I talk about recreating the rhythm of sleep. And that is very yes. important because you don't have insomnia because you lack an Ambien deficiency. You have it because right. multiple factors, exactly like Alzheimer's, multiple factors play into it. So we have to personalize those multiple factors. Uh, your book, uh, so if someone wants to start this plan, first off, become educated. They just order your book. Uh, you have two, right? Three. So Three. the first one you mentioned, that you, you held it up there, the end of Alzheimer's. Then there's the end of Alzheimer's program. And then the first survivors of Alzheimer's. And so this, I, I, I was really excited about writing this first survivors of Alzheimer's because so many people had gotten better and had written about their stories. So I asked seven of them, would you write a more extensive story? Talk about what you went through. Talk about what your doctor said to you. Talk about how you started doing this. Talk about what was easy and what was hard. Mm -hmm. And these are just compelling stories. I challenge anyone to read these stories, and they, they give you great ideas about what to do, um, without it bringing a tear to your eye. Some of these are, are amazing. Talking about watching, uh, one person talked about watching her mother die of Alzheimer's, watching her, 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 her grandmother and her father, and then starting to develop the symptoms herself and you know, looking at her children like, oh my gosh, is this going to keep going through our family? And she has turned around and done very, very well. So you know, these are th these are important things. Now it's easy. You know the, how do you how do you do this without getting overwhelmed? It's easy. Number one, you, you can either train, go you know, look at Recode 2.0 training, or simply look up, um, and you can go to uh, mycognoscopy.com or drbredison.com or Apollo Health Co. We've partnered with Apollo Health because they are a Silicon Valley group writing software. This is the future. How do we get larger data sets and get best outcomes for everybody so that you can go on there and you can get a trained physician and work with them? Um, people work with health coaches also. Um, and you can even, if you like, work with a group so that people share information. Uh, whether, you know, some people like to work more with a group, some people like to do more one on one. Whatever you like, it's available. And it's, and it's not overwhelming. What's overwhelming is living in a nursing home and having people give you drugs that are just basically meant to quiet you down and confuse you. And this is really sad to see. We see it again and again and again. So yeah, please, there's, there's so much that can be done to prevent and to reverse cognitive decline. As you said, this is the first hope. We published the first examples of reversal of cognitive decline in, in 2014. Again, freely available online in the journal Aging. 
you are, again, repeat for the fourth time, a hero in my mind. And I think anyone who listens who has an open mind will also agree to that. You know, I have to advise people that, you know, when you ask your traditional trained people about this, they're going to poo-poo it. There's no doubt because they literally don't have a clue. Mm-hmm. They don't know that this is the, how this system works. They're not trained into it. I mean, I fly small airplanes. I'm not trained into flying in a helicopter. You put me in there, I'm going to crash and die because I don't know anything mm-hmm. about it. Uh, but there are. we're lucky to be living in 2023 at this stage because we couldn't have accessed this like walk-in blood work we do that here right. at Nutrition World. We have a lab. Uh, we couldn't have done that 15, Great. 20 years ago. You you couldn't have twisted your physician's arm to make it happen. You write exactly what the blood work needs to be in your protocols. People can do that on their own. We have, we, we have and other people, and you have the whole list of professionals that can help assist putting a plan together. The thing that makes most of my clients so happy when they walk out is they're not looking for miracles. They're looking for a plan, a plan right. with confidence. And you give people that more than any one person living today because you have the experience, you have the credibility, you have the the stories, and you have the science. And that is magical. I cannot thank you enough, Dr. Bredesen, for saving the despair of so many people in this country by the work you have done. And I know it's not easy, so you are a blessing, my friend. Thanks very much, Ed. We all interested, if we work together, let's reduce the global burden of dementia. Uh, you know, and with COVID and a lot of brain fog out there, uh, you know, please get on active prevention or earliest reversals of cognitive decline. There is so much that can be done, just as you said. All right, my friend, all the best to you and your future for the next decades to keep doing this wonderful work. And again, everyone, you've got to learn to take control of your health by putting the right people in your life that you can trust. And all the best to you, my friend. And we will be talking again, I'm sure, in the next year. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Ed. Take care.